Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for August 22nd, 2021, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. The first reading from the thematic uh, line of attack is Joshua 24, 1 through 2a and 14 through 18. The semi-continuous selection is 1 Kings 8, I'll just say selected verses. Psalm 34, we continue our third week in Psalm 34, 15 through 22. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, our last week in Ephesians, I think. And John 6, 56 through 69, our last week Speaking in of John. Lasts. Yes, and then we're back in Mark. So make the most out of this John day because uh, now we don't get John for a while. But indeed, the last selection in the Bread of Life discourse and guess what I'm going to say, which I say every time it comes around, you need to add verses. You need to add 70 and 71. They're not the fun verses, uh, but, but they, they represent a larger critical theme in this particular, you know, in this passage of, you know, 70 and 71 is Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, yet one of you is a devil, he was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, for he, he, though one of the 12, was going to betray him. Judas is introduced for the very first time in the gospel at 664, not named directly, but his, uh, his act of betrayal is foretold here. And it's, uh, and that, and it's important to note that in 664, uh, that act of betrayal is actually a, a theme in this lecture because betrayal in this gospel is not handing Jesus over uh, at the garden. Uh, it is uh, not believing. It's it's respond. It's not responding. It's not entering into this relationship that Jesus has invited you into. So the ones who did not believe and the ones who would betray him. That's. That's the connection. So when Judas betrays Jesus, of course, that's at the end of chapter uh, that that's in chapter thirteen, and that betrayal is walking out. It's leaving. It's leaving that uh, that meal. <laughs> so that's in. That's really here. We have a meal here, and it's at a meal again that Jesus hosts that Judas will leave the building, and he went out, and it was night. And so I think you can bring all of that here, uh, the, those kinds of connections. And, it's, and what this then uh, invites us to think about in, in this particular section in verses um, in 6061 are the range of responses then to what Jesus is offering. And of course, the, the most unfortunate <laughs> response is a kind of, of rejection. And so, uh, so you get in verse 61, uh, the complaining, uh, and which we also had in verse 41 and 43. We have disbelief in verse uh, 64, those some who do not believe, some who do not see who Jesus is. We have flat out rejection in 66. And then 64 through 71 is that, is that betrayal. And so that, that's the first, I think, entry into this passage is it invites us to say, what will our response be? Uh, and with this, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? And it, we, we would be, uh, it, it's not the question is, what is this teaching? And it's not just what Jesus has just said. It's not just like uh, it, that you have to, you know, gnaw on his flesh. That's, I think that, that this teaching is the entirety, right, of what some disciples went away at this point in terms of what is it that um, the, this teaching is ultimately an invitation to life with Jesus and life with God that people can't get their heads around. That's really helpful talking about the range of responses. Mm. It, it raises a question for me, which I haven't, might be coming out of the blue. 
so the range of responses here are there's believers, believers and knowers together, right? We believe and we know. There are people who reject and who walk away and they're villains, or at least there's one villain here with Judas. So there's insiders, outsiders, and there's villains. I want more options <laughs> if I'm preaching this. Do you know what I mean? As, and this is, you know, of course, a problem across the New Testament with in books that are far more apocalyptic than John's gospel that divide the world up in neat and easy categories. But how do you how do you preach that? I mean, where do you invite people to stick around if they need a little more time? Or how do you how do you not make this passage uh, choose now whom you will serve kind of passage? Maybe you can. Like, maybe, okay. Uh, I mean, in, in part, this is a kind of a reworking of the latter part of John 3 uh, or the latter part of the Nicodemus passage. Uh, where, um, and this is the judgment. This is the crisis moment that the light has come into the world and people choose darkness rather than light. Nicodemus gets additional chances though. Uh, he does, but whether or not he actually, you know, um, whether or not he actually comes around at the end is up for debate, uh, right? But, but I don't know if you can, Matt. I, I think this is, this is in part what's at stake here in these latter verses of the of the bread of life discourse is uh, that that the the mention of Judas here is exact is the poignant moment here is exactly what we're supposed to see that uh, that how one responds to the light in the world uh, is uh, is either you are you see the light or you don't, you enter into the light or you don't. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, gray area or in fact, none. There's not a whole lot of options. You're either in, you know, you're full in with this relationship or you're not uh, and taking seriously what relationship looks like. So I don't, I, I yeah, I don't know if you can. All right. I, yeah. If if I were if I were up this Sunday, I would probably try to push back on that and say we know that real life is a little more complicated. I think you can say that. But, but, yeah, but the but, text I have to push back against the text. I'm going to do. You that. would. Yeah, that. yeah, you would have to That's do fine. that because I just don't think John gives you. I don't think John or Jesus gives you an out. Um, yeah, the and, text the text doesn't give. Mm -mm. If mm -mm. you buy into John's worldview that. The world is already under judgment. So Jesus doesn't come to bring judgment because it's already under judgment. What is judgment? It don't have a relationship with the father through the son. Mm -hmm. And so here it is. And this is that new, this is, this is the new life to which you're being called uh, mm -hmm. that we talked about last week. Uh, well, I, so yeah, I mean, I kind of like the fact that most, most of the better sermons are ones where uh, yeah, you want to push, push back on the text, but the text won't give. And finally, uh, you have to decide. Uh, in my, you know, most of the times, the, t the text wins. <laughs> well, I and I think you know the 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 worldview of John. I mean, you can you can do something with that just to remind people of what of of what's at stake for this community and to whom John is writing. And uh, it's, a, it's a community, of course, that made the choice to follow Jesus and actually was cast out of life, you know, that cast out of their synagogue and everything that, everything that life was about, their community, their family, their, uh, their, their social constructs or whatever. And so that, that piece of it is important here too, that Jesus is offering um, a life that, that was taken from them or, or that they chose, you know, that they chose to, to be in this relationship with Jesus and, and lost the life that they knew. And he's offering uh, a life here now with him. I think, you know, the other, another piece of this passage too is 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I mean that that's used that's used in some traditions as the gospel acclamation, 
Uh, and I, I always find it, dare I say, fun uh, to, to help people make those connections liturgically that, uh, you know, that the writers of liturgy, the composers of liturgy, the words, they didn't just fall out of the sky and make stuff up that this is, you know, this is, this is that biblical reference here. So what is that? I think you could do something then in the worship service along that, those lines as uh, making sure that you're using that gospel acclamation. And what does that mean? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, that that's the preparatory acclamation before hearing the gospel. So I would, you could also do something with that as well. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Verse 63, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you've got spirit and truth in John 4, but spirit is lower cased in most modern translations, which means the translators have concluded that we're not making a direct reference here to the Holy Spirit. Contrast that to Paul, for example, when Paul contrasts flesh and spirit, Galatians 5 is a good example. Uh, spirit is typically capitalized because I, and I agree, it's pretty clear Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit as the, the power that helps you wage war against the power of what Paul calls flesh. So anyway, my, my point here, and this is partly just some New Testament geekery and just a chance to teach about a couple of things. When Jesus says spirit, what is he talking about? Mm -hmm. And remembering too, a lot of people have weird and even I think wrong ideas of a tripartite, tripartite division of the human self, body, flesh, spirit. I mean, things that are pretty foreign to first century Judaism, right? That he's not talking about two different parts of the human creature when he speaks about flesh and spirit, or is he? I mean, what's going on in John when Jesus talks about spirit in this context? Well, I, I, that's a great question. And I, I thank you very much. You're welcome. My work, my work here is done, just to pose questions. But uh, I really, I think it matters because yeah. otherwise, here's the, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. But no, go ahead, go ahead. What, why it matters is because if this passage leads people to somehow despise the flesh or to despise embodied living, we've really missed a point. But I think oh, yeah. some people hear that in verse 63. Yeah, no, uh, you have to, Verse 63 has to take you back to uh, the prologue uh, where those are those are are those are born of God or born of born of man, you know, that you are born children of God. And then uh, it should take you back to the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus where uh, where Jesus says, what is born of the flesh is flesh and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, and this, this, this distinction here, I think spirit, had, it, it's not really, it's not the Holy Spirit here. You, you don't really get this full pneumatology, right, until the farewell discourse, because, but there is this connection of the way in which that spirit is connecting you to God, um, or it's God's spirit, but it's, but the formal sort of pneumatology is is really uh, is really in the farewell discourse. I think another reference you have to go back to is John four, where uh, they're talking about worship, right? And the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. That's also lowercase. Uh, in the Bible that I'm looking at, for the for the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, lowercase. Uh, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So it's, I think for John, I have to think about this a little bit more. But I think for John, it's it's not antithetical to the flesh because Jesus is flesh, but it's a way to designate. Uh, I think it's a way to designate where life comes from uh, and what fullness of life looks like. It's this, it's connect, and you know, especially if you think of the ways in which spirit can be translated, right? Panuma, breath, um, wind, uh, and and so it, but it's a it's an acknowledgement or I think a connection to God is the source of life. 
uh, here and, uh, and, and not to be pitted against uh, the body or flesh because Jesus is flesh, if that makes sense at all. I don't know. It, does that help at all? That's kind of, those are the it connections does help. I'm making. Yeah. I, I think spirit has a connection to life in John, another really yeah. important yeah. Johannine word. That, yeah. Right. And that's of course, all over the old Testament in terms of what animates the human body and the human body itself. Ancients knew this as well as we do is corruptible. It right, dies, falls apart. But the spirit is this thing that continues to enter the part of it. So I guess I guess I see it a connection to this idea of a God who lives, yeah, who does not die, um, in terms of you know <laughs> who the Father is talking about Jesus, right? Some of the reasons mm -hmm. why the incarnation is such a scandal. But mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. thanks. That's just yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Might be the only one who found that helpful, but I found it helpful. Yeah, great. Well, happy bread of life to everyone out there. Yeah. Ah, it's all well, now, done. Joshua, so choose this day whom you will serve. Rough, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's the what connection, happens. right? Well, it's this idea of decision, right? It's like, yeah. what are you going to do? You've you've been granted all the, the, the evidence I'm willing to grant right now. and But for Joshua, right. of course, that evidence is is more historical and more military you know right, this is this is the time mm -hmm. you've mm -hmm. conveniently skipped over all the uncomfortable parts of joshua and now it's like here's the land who wants it how are you going to live add verses so add verses <laughs> yeah what like the whole book at least the next verse <laughs> but joshua said to the people you cannot serve the lord uh-huh that is, if you stop here and imply to people, you can do it. Choose this day who you'll serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, we're going to serve the Lord too. See, they, they chose the Lord. And then Joshua goes, no, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, my, you know, one of the few Latin phrases I know, uh, right? Non passe, non peccare. It's not possible not to sin. And it's not possible for you to choose God. And actually, the rest of the Deuteronomy history proves it. Yeah. How'd they do? Joshua, uh, you know, this early speech, could they choose the Lord when they were led by uh, judges? Nope. Could they choose the Lord as a united monarchy? Nope. Could they choose the Lord in the northern kingdom? Nope. Could they choose the Lord in the southern kingdom? Nope. So then what's God going to do with the people he has chosen that cannot choose him? It's going to stick with them. Mm -hmm. And eventually come in the flesh in Jesus, who I chose you, you did not chose me, Ch mm -hmm. chose me. Cho I said that, choose me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think to, to end it here, you know, uh, and, and this is this verse, especially choose this day whom you will serve as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's this, on a few plaques. It's on a few plaques, especially that as for me and my house, you know. Uh, it's, it's a great housewarming gift, especially in the Dutch tradition. This is a very big verse. So my, my good friend Hans has this verse up in his house because uh, it's a very big uh, verse in that tradition. Um, out, of, out of context, I think it implies that, yeah, you can do it. Mm. So Rolf goes around with a stack of post-its and when he finds that you in the hallway, he sticks on a post-it that says, you can't. You can't, you can't for he is my house God. Mm. that would uh that would change the plaque considerably <laughs> yeah well uh, that's you know me and my house we did our we tried we, did our, we tried <laughs> <laughs> we don't do too too well at that it would be fun to like rename the plaque that would be it would be fun well yeah. i mean it, it's you know that's you know that would be a, it's, it's already right. been done in some places with things like the um the non um, sappy cancer cards that somebody in a woman in the Twin Cities uh, produced. I can't remember uh, what they're called, but you know, um, but yeah, it, the, the non sappy uh, Bible plaque uh, business that you could sell to, you know, and then only pastors would buy them. You Somebody's cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. Yeah. Yeah. Old Lutheran yeah. probably sells those. Oh entrepreneurial right. invitation right there yep checking in on solomon he's doing pretty well 
built a temple. Yeah, He's doing great things. Can you help me with this, Rolf? Like, Everybody what's loves the, him. What's I can the, help you a lot. Okay, with what's going on here, like this little section. Right. Well, is that what we're supposed to get out of it? With just what Matt said, well, Solomon's it, doing well. No, making, no, making good, good choices. No. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> he had some help building the temple. First of all, you gotta if you if you're preaching through the semi-continuous Old Testament version, or just as a part of your sermon, helping people uh, to do so. Okay, you have to um, you have to supply Solomon has between uh, chapter two and now built the temple. That's kind of a big deal, you know? Yeah. And so now they're bringing the ark from uh, the tabernacle into, into the temple. And then you get Solomon's prayer. And this is really an important, um, I, I'm sure I'm gonna underwhelm, but it's a really long prayer. And so that's the problem with reading it. But especially in verse 22 is where the this lesson gets started then the lord stood before the altar in the presence of the assembly excuse me then solomon stood before the altar of the lord and he said and then it's a complicated theological prayer because on the one hand it says well, we know you don't we know you don't live in a house we know that all of heaven can't contain you um but and still yet here you are <laughs> readily available. So, that, I mean, that is the mm. mystery, mm. Uh, you know, the, the old parable that I think comes from the Hasidic tradition is uh, how big is your God? So, uh, so big that the entire universe cannot contain him and so small that he can live in your heart. Um, you know, that, mm. that's, the, that's the parabolic way of expressing the mystery of God's transcendence and yet imminence. Um, but then here it is. So, mm. What does that mean? Well, they, they only give you one of the passages this week. When a foreigner, uh, that is basically it's people can come here to be in communion with God. Likewise, when a foreigner who's not of your people comes from a distant land, uh, when a foreigner comes and prays towards this house, then, in, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, you know, and so on. It, it, it mm -hmm. gives different, different snapshots of what it means to have uh, a God who is available and in the presence of the people. And that is still really, I think, at the center of our worship life, that the mystery of God's presence, uh, whether it's in the community, in the word, in the sacraments. Uh, and what does that mean to be able to um, come together regularly for Sabbath worship, in our case, mostly, uh, and uh, be able to center our, our communities and our individual lives in God. That's really helpful. When I was in the Holy Land. Uh, <laughs> Please bring it on. Right. I've never no, been. For, for, uh, for new listeners, right? That's, that's the, the way to open a sentence and start a long, long story. Uh, when I've led groups, I've taught in the Holy Land. Uh, one of the questions that I like to start with is what makes a place holy for you, mm. which sounds like a simple question at the beginning, but it takes a long time for people to explain that people sometimes start with a one sentence answer and then they realize they've got to like couch it. They've got to put a story around it and they've got to do all sorts of things. But this might be a good way of talking about that as well. What does it mean mm. to encounter the holiness of God? There's this, this tension or this almost a contradiction that Rolf talked about or uh, that's part of the prayer that's, that's, that runs through scripture as well, right? Where does God dwell? But that's, it becomes really important, right? Because, and to locate it in place, right? Um, and a lot of American Protestants are quick to say, like nowhere, or all places are the same, or it's on a walk in the woods, or it's in nature. I mean, they, 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 they um, kind of abstract it, or they, they disperse it in terms of various places, but to keep pushing, right? And think about, is there a specific place that was holy for you at a particular place in time? What was that like in that experience? Well, uh, and a preacher yeah. might be able to, to play with that a little bit around this passage. Yeah, and I think uh, that also makes me think of uh, coming out of COVID, post-COVID, uh, post-pandemic, is that that's been, I think, a significant theological question. When you can't when we haven't been able to go to our places of worship, 
uh, where do we encounter God? What, what has replaced that or not replaced it, but what, ha what has filled that place and space in the meantime, where I think that would be a really rich uh, homiletical journey for people to imagine uh, when, they were, when they weren't able to go to the space that they were used to <laughs> uh, encountering God, or they, they, they thought, well, if anything, God will be there. Uh, and, yeah. and so to invite, where else have you then, where else have you uh, experienced the holy? Um, and what do you do when your holy space is destroyed or is denied yeah. to you is yeah. obviously a question that animates a lot of biblical thinking as well. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good. End of Psalm 34. Uh, we had three weeks in Psalm 34. Uh, thoughts on that? Well, I would, I would mostly point people to Jim Mead's commentary on the mm -hmm. website uh, at, you know, that, that in some ways I think uh, basically the uh, the lectionary is mostly um, completing. Oh, the last two weeks we kind of had passages that were Related. relevant to the um, bread of life discourse, and this week we'll just finish it out. You know, the, with the, the last part of Psalm thirty four. As I've mentioned the last couple of weeks, Psalm thirty four is an acrostic psalm, and so what you get is you get the um, you get the um, lots of great one-liners. So mm -hmm. if you know your Hebrew and uh, you look at verse 15, eyes, ayin, face, verse 16, pay. So, you know, basically you get these great one-liners, uh, theological one-liners based on the alphabet. And um, there's no, what holds it together is the alphabet rather than any sort of development or any sort of uh, uh, other sort of prayer structure. Um, but any one of those you could pull out and do something with uh, liturgically, you could do something with them homiletically. Uh, a refrain in your sermon, you know, saves the crushed yeah, I mean, spirit, things you know, like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. I mean, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Our last Ephesians. Ah, yeah. So what? Oh, it's, it's, it's an interesting passage, isn't it? it? Some people love this passage. Some people some really people don't like really, this really passage. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of children have been taught this passage because you get to make stuff mm -hmm. and <laughs> you get to have sword fights in your Sunday school classroom and play with all the toys that your parents wouldn't let you play with at home because they're too violent. Yeah, it's an interesting passage that some people really are drawn to and some are not. But I, it builds on what we looked at last week in 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 chapter five, this idea of the days being evil, and, and the idea of a, a book like Ephesians that is so doxological that tries to return praise to God, that tries to lift you up into heavenly places, still recognizes a rootedness in a world that really is. Um, corrupt and corrupting, corruptible. And this tries to at least name that struggle, which again, a lot of people really experience. Maybe don't wanna talk about exactly what is the nature of evil or anti-God forces in the world, but you wanna acknowledge that, that, that life is just awful uh, for here's, a lot of people. Here's what I love about this passage this summer. So, you know, who was it that put Jesus to death and who stood around the cross and cast dice for his clothes? It's a bunch of guys dressed like this. And so you've got, what is the symbol of the man, the empire that put them aside to death and uh, eventually crushes uh, Jewish resistance uh, and crushes Jewish independence in 70 and then later uh, in the second century? And what the author of Ephesians is doing is flipping that, the very symbol of imperial um, imp uh, oppression and flipping it on its head and, and taking that symbol and, and re-mythologizing it as for the gospel of peace uh, in verse 15. And so that's what I love about this. And if this is the summer doldrums uh, for your preaching in August, uh, here's a fun thing to do. 
you know, here's a fun thing to do is to, um, you know, talk about these different places, you know, the sword of the spirit, the, so, so spirit, righteousness, peace, faith, um, and so on. I have one joke about it though. Okay. Then I have one thing. Yeah. Which is uh, a pastor who I know, um, said in his sermon instead of the fiery darts of the devil the diary farts of the devil and then it um couldn't get it out of his head you know <laughs> and kept saying it so well, I, the diary farts of the devil there you don't go. say that right now it's well, in your head I, some of you are going to say it <laughs> no those are those are really i think uh, helpful comments in this passage. I think it's true. You, you, there's a there's a resistance to kind of like the the martial, but uh, the martial sort of uh, attire. But to put it in the context. But I think another thing. Um, I I it reminded me of Lauren Winner's book, Wearing God, and she has this chapter on clothing in the Bible, and uh, and if you know to change clothes can be to change one's sense of self to change clothes is to change change one's way of being in the world uh it clothing shapes identity it also communicates something about our identity to the people we meet and so i think you could do something with that as well like that that attire what the clothing that you put on um what is it doing for you what is it communicating what is it uh what is it uh how is it how is it protecting you and, and how is it creating your identity? She's talking particularly of the language of putting on Christ, which is not here necessarily, but there's that, that, that metaphor in, um, in what does it mean to put on uh, the, uh, the, this, you know, the breastplate of righteousness that's communicating identity in the world and, uh, and to whom you are loyal.